<coughs> I got COVID. This is my vitamin C water. <coughs> I've read that this is better for you than a uh, white wine. I do healthy things for my body. <coughs> Light spoiler warning for The Emperor's New Groove, released in 2000. The Emperor's New Groove is the title of a 2022 nature documentary narrated by Barack Obama. The Emperor's New Groove is what I call people I have a crush on. The Emperor's New Groove is a solid 6 out of 10 animated family movie about a flamboyant, selfish tyrant who learns to care about other people via becoming a llama. I'm feeling a light to decent 6 on this thing. It's also one of those movies where a man becomes an animal, which is funny. No! All right, I'm a dog. What? <laughs> That's not a man. The best part of this movie is Kronk. He is funny because he is an evil henchman who isn't evil. He's just like a good-natured, capable guy who got hired into a government position working for someone that he just doesn't notice is homicidal. He will be dead before dessert. Which is a real shame because it's gonna be delicious. His job is not really specified. He's clearly some sort of domestic servant. He's physically capable and enthusiastic and a multifaceted artisan. <gasps> My spinach pus. He's what in his late 20s? He's often distracted away from doing the evil boss's bidding because of his passion for the quality of small tasks. Isn't that right, Crunk? So for HaHa's, they put this gentle, warm energy in the employment of the malevolent Yzma, who also goes by the name of Eartha Kit having the time of her life. This act of highest treason has but one punishment. Death. God! This movie is fine. It's fine. It doesn't really hold up on a rewatch, but Kronk is the best part. The studio clearly noticed that Kronk was the audience favorite, and so when it came time for the direct-to-video sequel, they made him the main character. Kronk's new groove. Do you know about this? D does anybody remember this? This movie is bad. It has one good joke. Front and center, names and ages. <laughs> Sir, Chuck is Sir, age seven and three quarters, Sir. And this is Yuppie. Um, he's only a half. I like, I like that. This is Yuppie. Um, I like that. Um, the main reason this movie sucks is it's a direct-to-video Disney sequel. They are B-team operations. They tend to end on dance sequences. But even the Y2K VHS sequel syndrome is not the main reason that this feels disconcerting right out the gate. It's more the premise. Like, the Aladdin sequels aren't as good as Aladdin, but they're at least about Aladdin. Do you guys remember the Aladdin sequel? Do you remember the Aladdin game on CD-ROM? <laughs> Ooh, I remember it very well. I still get kind of emotional when I think about the third Aladdin movie, the King of Thieves with the open sesame and the knives. Why does it make me so wistful? Was it because I was a scared little brown boy being raised by a single white mom, not knowing where my brown father went, not knowing where this pigment came from, not being able to deal with reality, preferring to live inside a fictionalized universe and staring at a screen, completely lost in the fantasies of my hyperactive mind, staring with wonder, with overwhelming emotion at Aladdin reconnecting with the father who abandoned him. Your father's a man. Man who taught you who you are Mine was never there Here's a segue Kronk also has a complicated relationship with his father Apparently It's my father He's He's Coming for a visit And I don't like it I don't like it. I don't want to hear about Kronk's parental issues. <laughs> Internal torment and a lack of self-esteem is not what people liked about Kronk. But some degree of that is required when you make a person the main character of your movie. So now he, he's, he's got strife. <gasps> they put strife in Kronk. Scientists at Tulane University's Primate Research Center announced they have taught a gorilla that someday it will die. It makes sense when you got Kuzco doing weepy narration of how tragic his life is. But Kronk? This is the guy that... Sings his own spy music. Oh, he's doing his own theme music? The whole underdog MVP sparkle of Kronk is in his contentedness not being the main character. Despite the fact that Kronk is the best part of Cusco's movie, shifting the focus from Cusco to Kronk actively ruins Kronk. As a random critic I found on the Wikipedia page named David Nusser aptly put it, Though Patrick Warburton's Kronk was undoubtedly the best thing about The Emperor's New Groove, this film proves that the character works best in small doses. Forced to carry an entire movie, Kronk becomes tedious and, unbelievable as it seems, unfunny. Thank you, David Nusser. I hope you're not, like, cancelled. The fact that the best part of this movie was a side character wasn't something that needed to be fixed. 
His position in the hierarchy was the reason it was so good. In Christopher Nolan's superhero masterwork, The Dark Knight, Heath Ledger's performance as the Joker is one of the best performance in all of cinema, but it's only as rich and renowned as it is because there's also a whole good movie surrounding it. The Joker is not the main character of the movie, but a force of nature, much like Kronk. Just because it's the best part of the movie doesn't mean it will be better if they are most of the movie. We have the Joker, we have Kronk, why do we feel the need to give them center stage? Why do we want them to be the main character? Why do you want to be the main character? <coughs> Part 1, Main Character Syndrome. Why do you fantasize about how sad everyone's gonna be at your funeral? Why do you do that? What sick need of yours does it satisfy to lean against the window of a bus on a rainy day while listening to Phoebe Bridgers? Emotion, emotion, I don't know about you guys, but I think I'm special and a genius and I should be in charge of everything. It's the feeling I carry around with me and then when I get attention for my merits, the feeling gets a good- the, the feeling's like, right? Upon further analysis, I think that I think this for two reasons. The first is that I genuinely think I am of great capacity and ability, I am talented, I am original, and if I am put in a position of authority and creative control, I will use that power to make things that are beautiful that people will like. I would be a service to society. The second reason is I have a deep-seated chronic fear that I am inherently secretly bad and when people genuinely finally get to know me they will realize I'm a fundamentally unworthy person so every opportunity I have to contribute or prove my value is me justifying my existence and belaying the necessity of a suicide. <laughs> Those generally are the two reasons that I want to be known and successful. One of those is pretty wholesome, and then the other one is pretty fucked up. So here's a little audience interaction moment. Which of those two wolves inside of me, if fed, will generate the best possible art? Careful with this, if you're thinking of being like, well your trauma is maybe what gives you your creative drive, I encourage you to shut up. One might engage in the transformative miracle of turning trauma or suffering into something beautiful via creativity, but that does not mean that their creative drive came from the trauma. Your, your panic attack did not help you edit that. I'm saying if the goal is great art, then which of these two motivations is the most expedient path towards it? The motivation to give the best of yourself or the motivation to soothe the worst of yourself? Yes, I am literally separating your motivation to create into love and fear. Do I'll kick Donnie Darko's fucking ass. You can't just lump things into two categories. Things aren't that simple. I want you to really think about this because you will immediately know that the love impulse is the better for you psychologically, but that's not what I'm talking about. Your well-being is not important to me. I don't care about people, I care about art. I care about art, not people. That's the difference between me and your motherfucking favorite YouTuber. I hope you die. <laughs> My limited affinity for people stems from the fact that without them, there could be no art. Do you see how that works? It's not authentic affection for humanity. I'm not killing myself or you as a means to an end. <coughs> and what we just sorted out there was causality. Cause and effect in order and being clear about that and being clear about that is also how you're going to understand which motivation is going to make you the better servant to quality. When my motivation to create art is in my self-esteem and confidence that I have something to offer that will be of service to others, the effect I'm traveling towards is great art, quality, positive result. That's the effect. The cause is my control and, um, agency. The cause is me being special and paid attention to, and the effect is great art. Alternatively, if I seek the spotlight to satiate an internal hunger I have for validation, the effect enshrined as the goal of the operation is the placating of my insecurities. I now want the art to be great, and for me to be at the center of it, so that I don't kill myself. Understanding the cause and effect relationship, having insight as to the cart horse orientation of your endeavors will grant you the clarity to quality. Uh, what is it you're doing? Why are you doing it? Is it working? Check your cause and effect. Bitch, when I'm making a YouTube video, I want the most control and I want all the glory. I want my motherfucking face on it and my words and my editing and my all my things because I feel that will create the highest quality. That is my conviction. If I thought that quality would be served by me taking a more minor role in the production of this product or performance, then my math would require me to submit 
to the strongest authority. If I thought that my videos are better if someone else edited them, I would get a, a, someone else to edit them. If I could get someone else to write my fucking videos, it would make my life easier. But then they wouldn't be my videos, would they? And people like that it's me. And I like that it's me. And I can't outsource me. <coughs> but is the goal my personal glory and bragging rights? No. It's quality. Decisively framing quality as your goal while dissuading your fear-based motivations will reveal to you when your centrality is not necessary to the excellence of an operation. Sometimes you are best utilized as a side character. Kronk has incredible value as a side character, but his quality sharply diminishes as the lead. And what about you? Do you want to be a star? Is your stardom conducive to quality? Are you a main character? Are you afraid to find out? Part two, the contract. Make a contract with me. So just a second ago, I split your creative cognition into two pieces. There's one road to creation that is inspired by belief in yourself. And then there's another road to creation, which is inspired by your lack of belief in yourself. Love motivates us to pursue something, to commit to it, to invest our care and energy and time into it. And fear makes us avoid something that biology calls death and sociology calls no one liking you anymore. Most artists are not prone to to espouse the only reason they make things is because of like a deep insecurity and damage inside of them and th th most of the time people default to being like i do it for others i do it for the fans but what if you ain't got any fans does it ruin the whole gig for you if you aren't special and you never will be how much of your desire to create is rooted in your love for the craft and medium and universe and how much of it is based in your insecurities and your anxieties and your lack of self-esteem <coughs> <coughs> i'm not trying to ruin art for you I'm not trying to be mean to you. I'm being very harsh to your fear impulse to create because I've seen so many people for whom this is a massive secret. They are just barely keeping hidden as they post another TikTok video. Are you so obsessed with me? I will interrupt the rhetorical strategy right now to say it's okay to create something because you want attention. It is incredibly natural to seek approval and to want to discover your place in the world, prove your value. It's okay, buddy. However, like me, you probably have a little voice inside of you that screams at you all day that you're not good enough. And when someone compliments you or gives you the recognition you're seeking while creating things, it makes that voice a little quieter for a little bit but then it always gets louder again and look at any famous person ever in history to see the very obvious example of common knowledge that if you feed that voice it doesn't quiet down ever it goes into a monster and consumes you no matter how much success or validation you accrue externally this fear that you are not good enough is your survival instinct it keeps you active and alert and moving away from threats and in this Respect, it is good. It is true. However, it is of lower evolutionary truth than your transcendental volitional desire to improve the world, choose who you are and what you want to do, and be yourself. That is of a higher morality than your biological morality. Our biological sense of quality and survivorship is subservient to our intellectual design. We're lucky like that. We build a bomb. We build a computer. We make a music. And we are choice. But as much as we might want to shed this flesh prison and become an artistic concept, we are still animals and the sphere and anxiety is in our cells. We are neurotic human beings constructed of needs and terrors transcending into consciousness. There is no point pretending you are 100% magnanimously committed to service of art. In fact, leaving any of these secret, shameful, scared, selfish motivations to create any of these expectations of a salve over a suffering that you don't want to look at actually gives it more power over you. The, the less you acknowledge it, the more it will seep into what you do, burst out at unexpected times, interrupt your priorities, have you swinging between feeling like a god and feeling like a failure. A useful way to conceptualize this common problem that creatives deal with was provided by Davey Reedon in a guest lecture at Alto University. Even if you don't have like a hit game or something like that, you still have this contract inside of you that tells you why you're really making whatever it is that you're making, what the deeper reason for it is. Just as it was praise and validation for me, perhaps for you it's the need to prove yourself to someone who thinks you won't make it, or a self-judgment that the only people who are valuable in this world are the people who are churning out creative content all the time, or a desire to be a part of a community, to belong to a group of people who you can connect with and be inspired by. And maybe, you know, like me, you, you just want people to recognize you personally and tell you that they like your work and so therefore they like you. What's your fear-based contract? 
What's your secret reason that you're making things behind that admirable one? My personal secret contract is that if I do enough brilliant, shiny, and interesting things, people will tolerate and accept me. Implicitly meaning if I don't do good enough stuff, I am not worth loving or living. So that's my secret contract. What's yours? One might immediately spring to mind, or maybe you have a vague, queasy, called out feeling in your tummy right now, or maybe you don't have one and you're already enlightened, sitting under a tree, meditating, not watching this video. But luckily, wherever you're at with your creative philosophy or mental health, there is an exceedingly simple way to clarify your contract. You just ask yourself. Just ask yourself. Even though you didn't get to decide whether or not to have this contract, you do get a choice in how you're going to respond to it. You can start right now, today, by asking yourself, what is the real reason that I'm doing what I'm doing? Why am I making stuff? But the cool part about this is that if you keep asking yourself this question, eventually you will get a response back from the unconscious part of your mind that knows what your deeper reason really is. It's pretty fucking simple. <laughs> you don't have to be perfect, just aware. Find that secret invisible contract within you that you didn't even notice coming into existence and check its terms. Don't let it remain unspoken. Don't allow it the power of shifting around in the darkness unchallenged. Shine a light on it and expose it for what it is. It's okay to have a little voice in you that wants to be popular, that wants to be liked, that wants to be admired, so long as that voice is ultimately subservient to the real reason you make things which should be more transcendental than just to satiate your ego. I don't believe that people make things just to satiate their own ego. I don't think that creativity has sprung forth from humanity's heart as a reaction of the fear of death or loneliness or abandonment. I think that that creativity in your veins is God incarnate and you're manifesting heaven on earth. The point of clarifying your contract of enumerating the most selfish, weak, fearful possible reason you would be doing something is to disenfranchise it of power it has over you by remaining in your subconsciousness. Don't let your lower instincts, your biological and sociological survival instincts control your artistic impulses. Don't let them determine your purpose. You have your conscious choice, your intellectual design, Action rather than reaction. I'm a person and my name is Anakin. Figure out your main character syndrome reason, then decide your real reason. If you had nothing to fear, no damnation to avoid, what would you pursue for the sake of pursuing it? Look inside of yourself and see your fear and see your love and choose love. You gotta choose love, baby. It's all about love. <coughs> Part three, the inherent limitations of dialectics and the encompassingly unifying implications of emergence. So this has been fun. I had fun, you have fun? It's been fun, hopefully useful, maybe reductive. You can't just lump everything into these two categories and then just deny everything else. The creative process is not a tangible thing you can split in two and describe in objective material terms. It's a collective consciousness soupy thing that is at the cutting edge of existence and anytime you try to contain it with words or concepts you're necessarily leaving some things out but temporarily splitting it up into words and concepts and allowing these two forces to speak to each other was marginally useful don't you think so if you think so you're not the first the school of thought we're describing is dialectics i first learned of dialectics because of dialectical behavioral therapy which i used because i have borderline personality disorder because of something to do with aladdin and the king of thieves don't worry dad i can and take him alone. But you're not alone. Not anymore. People with borderline personality disorder tend to exist on an axis of extremes, often making harsh judgments and using black and white thought. Dialectical behavioral therapy counteracts this by explaining dialectics thusly. These two extremes you're fluctuating between may be simultaneously true. Instead of trying to figure out which one is true, endeavor to accept both simultaneously for a more comprehensive view of reality. The methodology is not to pretend that these extremes don't already exist in your mind, but to accept them and utilize both of them concurrently to walk in the center, synthesizing thesis and antithesis for the optimal course of action. This is a useful way to try to find truth and explain reality more broadly, extracting us from the soup of everything being intermingled and undefinable choosing to split it into two pieces and then letting those two pieces compete and be sharpened by each other, hopefully revealing truth by their synthesis. However, the unfortunate perversion that dialectics often unwittingly perform is by splitting reality into these two extremes, validating these two extremes as the summation of reality. That is to say, if we separate reality into A and B and then try to use A and B to discover the truth, we are agreeing that reality is composed of just A and B.
in some respect, which is not true. Reality is three-dimensional. You can't successfully slice it in two. Aristotle. Every dialectic slice you make has a bias and implications that traps reality into a framework that is not all-encompassing. The manner with which I want you to understand dialectics is not synergy, finding a happy medium, or selecting a victor, but emergence. Your secret contract and your conscious choice are not two opposing forces, one of which must win or else both must be used to achieve a happy medium. They are two small bits chipped off of something greater. Theoretically, if you smush these things together, they become the thing that we actually give a shit about, the thing we're actually talking about, what was it before we split it. You could say the emergent of this dialectic is the motivation to create, but again, I feel like that's too small a slice of it. The motivation to create art presupposes poses art itself. So this is still yet a small slice of the larger thing. What we're talking about when we're defining our relationship with making things, with being inspired and doing them, what we're really talking about is art. The sun we're orbiting is the inherent value we see in creativity and art. You're making it because you already know that art is valuable. Either art is valuable, therefore if I do it, I will be valuable, or art is valuable, therefore I want to be in service of it. That is a thing worth doing. Either way, the value of art is the unquestioned higher truth. Never get so lost in your dialectics and fractal classifications that they cease to be useful because you've lost sight of the summit. So yes, identify these things within yourself for your clarity, knowledge, and betterment. Ask yourself, what do I really want? Why am I doing what I do? Why do I create what I create? Embrace your shadow, choose love, but at the end of it all, most importantly, to unify these things towards its genuine purpose. We are on the side of art. Its greatness is what compels me. We are on the side of art. And if you're not, you have no business making it. We are on the side of art. And if the art flourishes under my reign, I will take the reins and be the star and do the best I can. We are on the side of art. And if I'm a side character, if that's what I'm destined to be, if that's where I'm best utilized, if the art is at its most optimal when I am in a supportive role, then I will be the best supporting role that I can be. We are on the side of art, and I knew it as a child, watching Kronk get crushed under the weight of a role he was never meant to play. Kronk was distinct and spectacularly charming in the strange mosaic of a kid's movie in the first place because of his egoless commitment to quality and service, shamelessly and confidently doing the best job he can, unhampered by the self-interested desires that haunt the rest of the cast. Pacha wants to keep his home, Cusco wants his riches, Yzma wants the throne, and Kronk just wants to do a good job. Be Kronk! Your goal should be quality. Therein you will find your self-esteem, your purpose, and your offering to the universe whether or not you are the star. The success of others is not a threat to you because we are on the side of art. A minor role is not demeaning but honorable because we are on the side of art. And when your time comes and you take center stage, you won't be taking anything away from anybody else. It won't be because you sought it out. It will be because your centrality is conducive to the highest quality of the moment. Be Kronk! We are on the side of art. <laughs> I think I'm an addict, want the world and I'm a habit I'm so fucking dramatic, got all my bones up in the attic And I dance them all around like a marionette <laughs> I almost let the COVID juice out. I almost feel like I got mixed up. <clears throat> okay. Oh yeah, we still in this bitch. Why do you make things? <laughs> I knew it was going to be some fucking question like this. I think I make things because I can't not. It would be unnatural for me not to. And it's also just how I engage with the world. The second question is, why do you really make things? <laughs> because I need people to think I'm smart. When I create something that is pretty much only to um, put my subjective representation into a physical manifestation, other people see that and they go, I really see myself in this or I relate to this. 
that to me says we are all a part of one beautiful uh, collective of, of organisms. And the fact that I made this for me and you're like, well, this is for me. I'm like, yes, because you are me and I am you and et cetera forever. Why do you really make things? Um, I love to have people tell me I'm smart and brilliant. And I love to create things that people connect with emotionally. It is almost a godlike power that I feel I probably shouldn't have access to. I want people to leave my, whatever interaction they have with my content, with me, whatever, with my art, whatever I create, a little bit better. I try to teach and all the things, but at the end of the day, the main core of it is I don't want people to leave worse off because I think that all of us are in relation to each other. And as much as I joke about being like a garbage and blah, blah, I deeply care about the way my actions, my words, everything will affect other people around me. So follow up question, why do you really make things? The boy I think I'm trying to prove to myself that like people care or give a fuck about what I have to say so that maybe I will care and give a fuck about what I have to say. I make things because I feel like it's what I was put on the earth to do. Okay, cool. Now, why do you really make things? I make things because I like attention. I have the biggest ego ever. And I feel like everyone should hear what I have to say. Um, I think it's Drew Gooden. as a commentary channel, sort of talking about things and being like, here's my opinion on this and having people come to my channel and be like, oh, I agree. Um, these are the thoughts I have, but I couldn't put them into words and you yeah. put them into words for, I think that is, there's value to that. Why do you really big things? Oh, okay. I like when people tell me I'm special and they think that I'm a good little boy. Um, 